thank you so much for coming this evening to uh, share the event with us. I'll adjust the microphone. Thank you for being here. Is that good? Can you hear me? Okay. This is the original publication of the diary. It was published in 1983 with the title Une saison gâtée, Journal de la guerre de, et de l'occupation, 1939 à 45. Um, well, I, it, as I say, it was published in 83. That was about 30 years after the author's death. Charles Brice was born in 1874, and he was in his 60s in World War II. He had five grown sons, and they all had families, and they were all involved in the war in one way or another, one of whom was in the resistance, and on and on. But um, I will cut the introduction short. I just want to tell you a little bit more about Charles Riest himself. He was a financial expert, wore many hats. He, uh, the Rockefeller Foundation funded a research institute he had uh, that had to do with economics, data. He thought data was very important to back up theory. Uh, he was a professor and on and on. Anyway, uh, he was very well read. He spoke many languages. So, the diary uh, is beautifully written, and I'm just grateful I had the opportunity to translate it with the help of my husband, Dan, who shared the adventure with me. It was quite an adventure over several years. During World War II, Reese's many activities were curtailed, and to occupy his brilliant mind, he started writing this diary. He, I have photographed the actual pages of the diary. I found the manuscript in France, um, and I won't go into that story here, but it's written on his personal stationery, very thin paper, edge to edge, tiny writing. And um, he started with the first page, September 2nd, 1939, and he wrote at the top, War. Yeah. Uh, one of the highlights of the diary is the three Jewish grandchildren. One of his sons was married to a Jewish woman and they had three daughters. And so a great deal of his um, mental effort was thinking on how to protect them. He had many contacts. He knew people all over the Western world, in fact. And it took him two years. I won't take the time to read the passages, but it took him two years of pulling strings, including getting a, from the Baptist church a, a certificate of baptism for the girls. And he was finally able to get them certified as, quote, not belonging to the Jewish race. This was a certificate, uh, very rare. And of those years, he said, I believe nothing has aged me more over the past two years, especially this last one, than the anxiety I have suffered for these three children. There they are, safe and sound, but how shameful to have need of those papers signed by the infamous Darquier de Pelpois. What better name for a villain, right? <laughs> Darquier de Pelpois. So, um, so I translated, I'll just tell you about my translation of the title. Une saison gâtée is literally a spoiled season, the, the rotten season, the corrupt season. But um, with consultation with uh, some people dear to me. We came up with this title, Season of Infamy, to echo Franklin uh, Roosevelt's famous 
reaction to the bombing of Pearl Harbor. The diary begins with a vivid description of the exodus from Paris as the Germans invaded France. And in the interest of time, I'm just going to read this one bit of French and the rest, of course, they're excerpts since it's a diary. The rest I will read in English. 2 September 1939. Nous partons le matin pour retrouver Jean. Jean was his eldest son. He essentially wrote the diary for Jean and his family, not intending that it would be published. Voiture remplie d'enfants, de valises, avec des matelas sur le toit. Foule à Nevers, foule à Moulin. Nous trouvons encore une chambre à l'hôtel de Jean, en face de la gare. So I'll continue in English now. Saturday, 2 September 1939. We set off early to visit Jean in Moulin. Cars full of children and suitcases. This, of course, is as the Germans are entering France. There's a huge exodus from Paris. Cars full of children and suitcases with mattresses on the roof. Crowds at Nevers, crowds at Moulin. But we found a room at Jean's hotel across from the railroad station. He showed up at 7.30, happy to see us. His job is to shoe the horses for four regiments, and he is amazed by the detailed instructions given to him in a little notebook. The military command foresaw, he says, all except the fact that horses from the Bourbonnais region have hooves that do not fit any of the three regulation sizes. Mm. And this um, little bit of bureaucracy is reminding me of what's going on in Puerto Rico right now. But anyway. The next excerpt um, has to do with another fascinating part of the diary. Early on in the war, um, President Roosevelt actually requested he told Pétain that he wanted Charles Riest to be the ambassador to the United States. So Pétain has Riest go to Vichy. Overall, Riest spent two weeks there getting to know Pétain's inner circle, having dinner with them. And this, once he concluded, Riest concluded he couldn't possibly represent the Vichy government under the circumstances that he found there. This was his conclusion about that inner circle. 15 November 1941. I am mulling over the completely inane conversations I was privy to these last few days. That little clique of idolatrous reactionaries who surround Marshal Pétain have reached the height of folly with their allusions to Freemasonry, their aversion to the word republic, and their general lack of culture. This suggestion of holy secrecy, this hatred of anyone who does not rally around the new cult, it is all grotesque. These people do not have a single new idea, a single original perspective that might penetrate the confusion of the time to provide a vision of the future. Who has noticed the rise of military demagogy that typifies Hitlerism? How is it that this little court, in which the stale ideas of French conservatism have found refuge with an old soldier, cannot see that it will perish at the first shock? The impression of unreality that emerges is incredible. The next excerpt I will read is from December 20th, 1941. A week of horror filled with executions and the roundup of Jews. 100 people were apparently shot on Monday at Fort Montvalérien on the outskirts of Paris. Every day we learn more names of those arrested last Friday. Doctors, engineers, etc. Impossible to know where they are, maybe Drancy, maybe Compiègne. 
Count C assures me that the French government agreed to allow these reprisals to target the Jews so as to spare the rest of the French. The depths to which some of our people have fallen confounds the imagination. Uh, the last two excerpts I will read. Uh, the first one is very short and it expresses the absolute exhilaration of the liberation. This is 27 August, 1944. Paris is delirious with joy. General de Gaulle appeared on the balcony of the Hotel de Ville and needed only shout, Vive la France. This day crowns one of the grandest and most beautiful efforts that a man has ever made to raise his country up from humiliation. The whole country is cheering him today. Two weeks later, this roller coaster narrative takes a turn. 12 September 1944. My sister Eve passed away Wednesday night. From now on, nothing will remain of that radiant life but a memory in the hearts of those who loved her. The thought of her Danielle, who died in a concentration camp, haunted her to the end. Last night at 8 o'clock, we saw Mario, Leonard, and his wife come into the living room with somber faces. Leonard said, we have some bad news. We looked at them and guessed the horrible truth. Our son Jean, killed by the Germans on the 21st of August, the day after Eve was wounded. What a ransom for deliverance. Last June, Jean had written to Marguerite Degout this sentence, which is him all over. Each of us, he said, must feel at once solidarity with others and detachment from himself. That sums up his life and death. What an example for his children. There is nothing more now but silence. People will say of him, greater was he than his father. As Hector in the Iliad, praise men will say of his son. Thank you very much. Well, that's it for this evening. Thank you all very much. Thank you to Malvin Books for having us here. Many thanks to our distinguished readers. And thanks to all of you for choosing to spend the Feast of St. Jerome with us here this year. Come back and see us next year. Thank you very much. <laughs>